I'm not great at catching stuff. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not great at catching stuff. <laughs> Hi folks, it's Switchback. Have you wondered how to choose a sleeping pad for backpacking? Well, today we're gonna geek out on sleeping pads. A sleeping pad is a very important part of your gear and your sleep system. So it impacts, of course, your comfort level. And that means you actually get some sleep and no sleep means no energy and no fun when you're trying to go on a backpacking trip. The other part of it is the warmth. So your sleeping pad is a big part of insulating you from the ground and we'll get into that a little bit later in the video. A few things to consider when you're shopping for your next sleeping pad for backpacking are comfort, weight, insulation, and bulk. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So I'm really glad that you're here so that you don't make the same mistakes that I did. One of the mistakes that I made was going up into the Sierra in October for the first snow and sleeping only on this pad, which has an R value of less than two, which means it was not very insulated. I was freezing even in a 15 degree bag and I had no idea why. There are a few different kinds of sleeping pads out there. The first we're gonna talk about are inflatable sleeping pads. These are inflatable sleeping pads right here. You can see sometimes they're kind of loud. They're insulated with mylar and or, or a synthetic material to keep the you warm from underneath. And again, we'll talk more about that in depth later. Most of them come with a patch kit and these are gonna be the most expensive out of the pads that we're gonna talk about today. Each of these two run about $200. The next pad we're gonna talk about is a self-inflating pad and these have foam inside of them, similar to those old school egg crates that we all knew growing up. And that is what gives it the shape to draw in air when you go to inflate it. Ultimately, you're still gonna need to blow air into it, but not as much necessarily as an inflatable pad. They tend to be fairly well insulated. They tend to be less expensive than an inflatable, but they're also gonna be really heavy and really bulky. They also tend to be fairly thin. You can see that this is about an inch thick. The last ones we're gonna talk about today are closed cell foam pads. What that means is it's basically an indestructible piece of foam. So you can't puncture this, you know, you can sit here and try with a rock, I'm not gonna damage it indestructible here. Trail dog Emma has tried. So they're indestructible, they're inexpensive, they're super lightweight, but they are bulky, of course. They make a great sit pad. I'm actually sitting on my dog's closed cell phone pad right now. However, they're not especially comfortable all on their own. A lot of times these are used in conjunction with another pad, especially on snow. They're nice to use on the ground if you're laying under the stars, if you're doing yoga. You can also cut it down if you want less bulk or if you wanna use it for your dog. Ultimately, making sure that your torso has pad underneath it is the most important. There are actually even some inflatable pads that are only torso length. In no particular order, the features to consider when you're choosing a sleeping pad are the R value, which is again, insulation, and we'll go in that in depth in a minute. The width, which usually they're about 20 to 25 inches in width. The thickness, they're usually about one to four inches in thickness. The length, again, some of them are only torso length, so maybe three feet long, and then they can go up to about 72 inches, which I'm sorry for the tall guys out there that that's about all that you can find. The shape, rectangle, mummy, or short. There are some that have rails to help reduce you from falling off of it. Sometimes under the technical specs, you can find the denier of the material and that will help tell you how puncture resistant it is. So for example, a pad like this is usually about 70 denier, which is pretty thick and heavy, uh, heavy duty, but also heavier in weight versus these pads, which are about 30 denier. Also look at the valves. Some of them are gonna only have a two-way valve and then some of them will have a one-way valve so the air doesn't escape while you're trying to fill it. Some pads even have multiple chambers so that if one pops, the other one stays inflated. The Sea to Summit Comfort Plus is one such example. And I do not have this pad. I have no experience with this pad, so that's about the only thing I know about it. What does the sleeping pad R value actually mean? The R value is the resistance to conductive heat flow. In other words, two objects that are touching are going to try to equalize in temperature. So when you're laying on the ground and that ground is cold, you're gonna lose heat 
as it's trying to equalize between your body temperature and the ground's temperature. And your sleeping pad can provide you insulation against this. The higher the R value, the more resistance to that heat flow, therefore the warmer it will keep you. The highest R value I have seen on a sleeping pad is on the Neo Air X Therm, which is at 6.9. You can actually stack R value by stacking sleeping pads. So a lot of people will use a closed cell foam pad, those foam spongy pads, underneath an inflatable. And if the foam pad has an R value of two and your inflatable has an R value of 4.2, then you have a combined 6.2. It is a simple addition thing. So thankfully that makes it easy. If you do a search online, you can find all these different charts about what R value you need at what temperature, and they are all different. And so it's really individual. I tend to err on the side of trying to go warmer as far as a higher R value in lower temperatures. Some charts will say you need a three when you're at freezing. I would err on the side of caution and go with at least a four, if not higher. You'll often see unisex pads and then women's pads. And the differences between the two vary. The women's pads will usually be shorter. They will also be warmer and the insulation sometimes will be more located in areas where women lose heat more, which will be in the torso and in the feet. Sometimes the shape will also be different. There are a few different ways to inflate your sleeping pads. One, you can blow air into it. This can be tiring, it can be time consuming. There are also rumors about mold in certain sleeping pads from the moisture in your breath. It may or may not be true that that happens. If your pad does have a foam layer, eventually that can break it down and then delaminate your pad, which means that the top and bottom layers separate and it will blow up like a balloon. Not a fun thing to have happen while you're out in the backcountry. Also, that moisture can make you get a little bit colder than it would be if you got air in there from another method. But the nice thing with using that method is it's ultra light. You don't have to carry anything extra. Next, you can use an inflation sack, a pump sack, an inflation bag, whatever you see it called in your particular case. It's a lightweight bag. It is one more thing that you need to carry. It can be used as a stuff sack. Sometimes it's even the original bag that your pad comes in. And this tends to be more efficient than trying to inflate it with your breath. Most sleeping pads will have a two-way valve. Right now, this is open for emptying the air out. So now it's all closed. And then this opens the one-way valve for filling. Many sleeping pads nowadays will come with their own pump sack or an inflation bag. So this particular one, the pad gets stored in here, but if you open like so, this will go into the valve like that. Remember just to do it on the one way. Right now, this is open for the two-way valve so that it'll let the air out. This is a thermarest wing lock. When you wanna go to fill it, you wanna close the wing lock, but leave the other valve here open like so. This one also comes with its own inflation sack and you can pop it on there like that. Make sure that you don't accidentally close this in the process, which I have done. Crap some air in there and you can start filling the pad like that. You can also try carrying a pump with you. And of course, this is the fastest and easiest way to go. They can be lightweight, but it is one more thing to carry and one more thing to keep charged. And they're kind of noisy. There are different ones out on the market. This particular one is the one that I like to use sometimes. And you can see it's pretty small. This pump comes with all these different accessories so that it will fit into the valve of whatever sleeping pad you're using. So it takes a little experimentation to figure out what the right one is for the pad that you're working on. This one looks like it might, yeah. So it'll actually lock in. So now you can see that this is locked in here. 
and then you turn it on. Turn it off. And because again, this is a one-way valve, it won't come out. Go ahead and close it and you've got that pad all set. This is the way that I would put this adapter on here and you have to kind of baby it a little bit more but it will go on like this. Pop that in there. We'll turn that off, put those away. Go ahead and close up that valve. It's nice and firm there. Next, I'm gonna show you how to deflate your sleeping pad. Again, this is a two-way valve. So we've got the one way on this way. This is the two way. And it's not going to deflate and let me fold it nicely if I don't try to get the air out on its own first. I will roll it up. And then unroll it. And then, in order to put it away, it needs to get folded. And if you're on rocks like this, make sure that you have some kind of protection or do it inside of your tent or on your ground sheet. Because it's a two-way valve, it will put a little bit of air back into it, but so I slowly deflate it again and get it rolled up. And I just put something heavy on it to keep it from un unfolding at the end. And I already got the inflation sack back in the one end of this. And then now I can pop this back in there Oh my gosh. Ah, well, now you get to see it again. Everything goes perfectly. All right. Let's try it again. Just in case you didn't catch it the first time. So what I was going to do is put it between my legs. And you can get it in like so. Voila. Don't forget to put the patch kit back in there. Next, I'll do the self-inflating. So again, open the one that says deflate, obviously. And then I close it after I deflate it so that it's less likely to re-inflate. But again, it should be stored with the valve open. The last one. All right. So again, this one has a double, has two different valves here. I'm gonna open up the main one, the one-way valve and the two-way. When you're storing your pads, keep the valve open and store them according to the manufacturer's instructions. If you threw those out, they're probably available online. The two main options are keeping it rolled up in the sack that it comes with or hanging it up. When you're out on the trail, 
keep your pad inside of the bag that it comes with so that you can protect it from puncture, whether it's on the outside of your bag or on the inside of your bag where your gear might rub against it. Some general tips for taking care of your pad. Don't leave it inflated in your car or in your tent where it will expand and potentially pop. Don't put inflatable or self-inflating pads directly on the ground. Use a ground sheet or a closed cell phone pad or both underneath it. Or of course, you can put it in a tent. Try to be mindful about rocks underneath wherever you're laying it. Sometimes people have issues with their sleeping pads sliding around in their tent. Some people use silicone dots or brush silicone onto their tent floor or their sleeping pad itself. You can also use a cabinet liner like this. Just cut a small sheet of it and put it underneath. You can put a closed cell film pad underneath it or you can even put it inside of your sleeping bag which is a nice trick if you have lots of extra room in your sleeping bag and you're getting cold. Put that sleeping pad in there and that'll help take up some of that volume. You can even get a sleeping pad cover if you're using a quilt or if you're not but it will help protect your sleeping pad from the oils in your skin. And speaking of those oils, make sure that you are cleaning your pad periodically. And I have a video about that right up here. Now that you have 50% of your sleep system down, how about the other half? You need a sleeping bag or a quilt. Well, in this video up here, I tell you how to find one of those and we geek out all over again. I hope you got some value out of this. And if you did, give it a thumbs up down below and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I will look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. So now that you have 50, yeah. Have a stroke over there? Apparently.